you have your Bibles, uh, please open up to uh, Acts chapter 19 as we are going to continue our study through the book of Acts, reading about the inspired history of the Lord's church. <clears throat> if you do not have a handout, Broken Baptism, raise your hands and we will get you one. <clears throat> And we will look at this in just a moment as we consider what's going on in uh, Acts chapter, excuse me, yeah, Acts 19, Paul going to the city of Ephesus. <clears throat> Before we get started in this, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? <clears throat> <clears throat> Holy Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for the freedom and the blessed privilege that we have to assemble together as your people to study from your word. We pray, dear God, that as we examine your word tonight, that we will have our hearts open and receptive, that we will have a mindset in which we will <clears throat> be willing to do whatever your word says. Pray, Father, that you will help us to reach out to those who are lost around us, help us to show them the gospel, help them to ha uh, us to have compassion upon them, Help us to have boldness to, to speak up when the opportunities arise. We repent of our sins, dear God, and we pray for forgiveness. We pray that you will help us to think and speak and live our life in harmony with your will. We thank you so very much for your amazing grace and compassion, long-suffering towards us. We pray for our upcoming family Bible school, that you will bless the efforts being made. Bless all the teachers with wisdom that they may be able to teach those who are listening that you may be glorified in all things. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Acts chapter 19, we have Paul <clears throat> going to the region where Ephesus is located. In chapter 18, last week we talked about Apollos. We were introduced to him, verses 24 through 28 of Acts chapter 18. We talked about how that he had a, a misunderstanding of the uh, baptism that is supposed to be in effect in the New Testament era. And so he was taught by Aquila and Priscilla. They pulled him aside and taught him the word of God or the way of God more accurately verse 26 so evidently based upon what you find in verse 27 and 28 Apollos was receptive to that correction uh, he didn't get mad didn't get upset he, he he was very teachable to have a person that is uh, described as Apollos was here in verse 24 as someone who was an eloquent someone who's mighty in the scriptures and at the same time have them to be teachable is a very rare thing because sometimes people, when they get mighty in the scriptures, they become very prideful and they can't be taught. They don't think they can learn anymore. We should never have the attitude that we can't learn. All of us can learn and we're going to continue to learn until we die or until the Lord returns, whichever comes first. We must continue to have that open-mindedness to God's will and be willing to uh, continue to study and examine ourselves in the light of the scriptures. So Apollos was a, a person that evidently took the instruction and started preaching the truth. Verse 27 and 28 of Acts chapter 18, they wrote letters of recommendation or a letter of recommendation when he went from them. And in verse 28, it says, He vigorously refuted the Jews publicly and showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And so he was willing to publicly debate. Apollos had that ability. He had the eloquence of speech. Verse 24 tells us he had the knowledge of the Scripture. Now he had a, a, a perfect knowledge in the sense of a complete knowledge of God's plan. And now he is a, a, a valuable uh, person in convincing people 
that Jesus is the Christ. So that brings us into chapter 19 in verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. He said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. Well, let's stop right there. That's the reason why we have this handout. We're going to talk about uh, broken baptism, using uh, that language to denote a baptism that is not in harmony with God's will. Here you have in verse 1, Paul passing through the upper region. He came to Ephesus. Now, the, later on, uh, to this church, Paul would write, and that's why we have the book of Ephesians in our New Testament. He would write to this church a little bit later on. It says in verse 2, he came and he found some disciples there. And most of the time when you find the word disciple, sometimes you automatically think, oh, these are talking about Christians. This is talking about people of God. But what we're going to see here in the context that these disciples were not of God yet. They were religious people. There were 12 men in all, verse 7, and it says that they were disciples. And what we're going to find out is that they are disciples of John, and they have not been baptized properly according to New Testament teaching. And as a result of that, that invalidated their baptism. If you remember the uh, timeline that was put on the board last week, uh, those who were baptized before the cross with John's baptism, that was an acceptable baptism. That's when that baptism was in force. But after the cross, New Testament baptism came into effect because it is into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which is now a reality for us. As a result, anyone baptized with John's baptism after the cross, they're not obeying God's will. So here you have 12 men here who had insufficient knowledge. Insufficient knowledge when it came to uh, what God wanted for the, their life in the plan of salvation. And here's a group of disciples that evidently Paul did not know. Now here's the interesting thing. When you come across, uh, come across people and you're going to study with them, or you're studying with a group that you're not aware of, what we're learning here is that it's proper and right to ask questions. You've got to ask questions. And so that's important to be done because you cannot assume just because they are called disciples that they're truly disciples or Christians that are in the Lord's church. So questions have to be asked. If you don't know about these people, questions have to be asked. And that's what I recommend to anyone that, that moves into another area. Perhaps they're looking uh, for a congregation to go to, and they, and they, they find one close to the, their new house, and they're going to go visit, ask some questions. I, I recommend uh, several types of questions to ask. We cannot just automatically assume that people are... Uh, right with God just based upon what we see on the, on the sign of a building or the, the sign in a uh, particular area. We have to be sure by asking questions. Of course, Paul did not know these people, so the only way you get information is to ask. You've got to ask. And that's why in a Bible study with someone, when you are studying with them, the whole process of studying, especially when it gets to the plan of salvation, is to ask questions. You've got to ask these questions so that people will think about their own situation and then you compare it with what the Bible actually says. So it says in verse 2, He said to them, 
Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. So these 12 men did not even know that there was a Holy Spirit. There was a deficiency in their knowledge. That answer to Paul sent up a red flag. There's something wrong here. And as a result of that, we see that will uh, trigger some other questions. Them not knowing about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit and the miraculous activity that was going on in the first century said something. Because if they had been baptized with New Testament baptism, they would have known you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And, of course, with the apostles being there, they would have seen signs, miracles, and wonders of the Holy Spirit being done. So for them to say, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit, shows that they had an insufficient knowledge. Their knowledge about things was not what it should have been. Verse 3, And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. So he gets to the heart of the matter concerning their baptism. Remember, he asked, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Then he's asking, Well, then into what were you baptized? See, belief and baptism go hand in hand in the New Testament. If you're a real believer in the New Testament, you're going to be baptized And you're going to do it for the correct reason and the way God prescribes. Look at verse 4. Then Paul said, as as they answered, into John's baptism. Into John's baptism. Now they were baptized into John's baptism. And based upon the first answer, means they did not know anything else. They were baptized into John's baptism and that's all that they knew. They missed out on the rest of the story, as it were. So now he's going to tell them, verse 4, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. The point of John's baptism was to prepare Israel, prepare them for the coming of the Christ. Well, of course, Paul is going to instruct them that Jesus is the Christ. And so there's going to be uh, further instruction concerning this. And we look at verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. We learn that they were baptized already with John's baptism. John's baptism was immersion in water. John's baptism was immersion in water to obey God. John's baptism was immersion in water to obey God for the forgiveness of sins, Mark chapter 1 says. However, God did not accept it anymore. They had a broken baptism. Their baptism was based upon insufficient information. So we see here a perfect example of why we should question people when it comes to baptism. When people come to us that that we don't know or we're studying with someone, we need to be asking questions because if there was confusion back then and the two baptisms you had were John and, and the New Testament baptism, can you imagine the confusion today with a multitude of denominations and all the stuff that they teach that's contrary to one another and contrary to the Bible? So we have to ask questions and don't don't just assume that just because a person says that they've been baptized that it's according to truth. And we have to examine it by asking these questions to get to the bottom of things, so to speak. And when these 12 individuals heard the truth on the matter, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now they're Christians. Now they're in the Lord's church. Now they are in a saved condition. Before that, they were not in a saved condition, and we'll see that in uh, just a moment. Now, look at your sheet, Broken Baptism. If you don't have a copy of this, raise your hand and we'll get you one. We've got a couple back here. Broken Baptism. <clears throat> I think I got two more, and that's it. Y'all have one.
I tried to come up with all the things that could be listed under broken baptism. If you have anything else, you can list it out to the side. But um, let's think about this when it comes to our modern day sitting, setting um, in the 21st century. Because what you have here in Acts chapter 19 is a case study of what to do when you come across people who have not been baptized correctly. There was incorrect baptism in the first century. There is a multitude of incorrect baptism in the 21st century. So we have to look at this as we look at broken baptism here on the handout. How and why were you baptized? That's something that you've got to ask yourself and examine yourself in light of the Scripture. And here's some of the things that fall under the category of broken baptism. And if you come up with something else, please raise your hand and we can add it to the list. Baptized as an infant. There are multitudes of little babies being baptized by the, uh, the, baby, the baby baptizing denominations. They're called pedo-baptist denominations because they baptize babies. And so that would fall under the category of broken baptism because you don't find that in the Bible. Nowhere do you find infants being baptized. Uh, infants are without sin. They are innocent. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20, The soul that sins it shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, neither the father bear the guilt of the son. So children are born into the world in a state of innocence until they become sinful later on through temptation and rebellion to God's will. <clears throat> so infants are no, in no need of baptism, and we're going to see a little bit later on, they're not candidates for baptism to begin with. So that's part of broken baptism. What about uh, baptism by sprinkling or pouring? Of course, that's called baptism, but it's not even baptism at all, based upon what the word is. The word baptism is actually transliterated from a Greek word that means to immerse, to submerge. So pouring and sprinkling are perversions of that that developed a few hundred years after uh, the New Testament period. In fact, I think it was in the 200s when the first case of pouring took place. I think the man's name was Novation. He was on his sick bed and he wanted to be baptized. Well, they got a bowl of water and just poured the water over him for baptism and they called it clinical baptism. And it, and it was used only in extreme emergencies. Then as time went on, it became a standard practice. And that's what you find uh, being practiced in the, the Methodist denomination, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholic, Episcopalian, uh, Presbyterian, if I didn't mention them, uh, they pour, they uh, sprinkle. Also, the Church of the Nazarene, they also uh, pour for baptism. And some of these will even give you the option. Do you want to be poured or do you want to be immersed? So you've got you know, multiple choice there as far as your choices are concerned. Well, that would be broken baptism. That's not even baptism at all because it's not immersion. So uh, there are some that are here that in your infancy, your parents had you um, sprinkled or poured, and, uh, and that is, of course, uh, something that you brought up to me in the past, uh, showing that, that, you know, this kind of mindset is alive and well, even in our generation. So there's baptism that is not full immersion. I've seen actually this happen where, where people will immerse almost totally, but they don't immerse them totally in water. Uh, and they, they claim that that is uh, an acceptable baptism. I watched it on a, a, uh, a documentary of a, a particular denomination. They immersed them and just kept really basically the head out and just lifted the person back up. Well, that's not, again, not baptism. That's not immersion. So that would be a broken baptism. The next one's probably the most prominent in our, uh, in our experience with our friends and neighbors. Baptism because you're already saved. And that is the belief that you're saved by accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. You say the sinner's prayer, you're saved. Then later on you're baptized to show that you're saved. 
But we're going to see as we look at New Testament baptism a little bit later, it is at baptism that a person is saved. So there's no such thing as a person saved before baptism, according to New Testament teaching. And when we get to that section, we'll, we'll see that clearly. So this would fall under the category of broken baptism. Someone who was baptized, perhaps they were even immersed, but they were doing it because they said they were already saved. They were saved back in April. They said the sinner's prayer. And then on uh, July 15th, they're going to be baptized to show that they're already saved. The Bible does not teach that. But that is the prominent (coughs) teaching in our area. And we're going to see what the Bible says later on. That would be broken baptism. Also, baptism into a denominational group in which you're joining a particular denominational group. Uh, We have no authority from the New Testament to join a denomination. Denominations are man-made religious institutions. And if you do what you have to do to get into that group, then you're doing what men say and not what God says. They can call it baptism all, all day long. It doesn't make it baptism. Feel free to speak up if anyone has anything that they'd like to say as we go through this list. Baptism because friends are doing it. You see that sometimes at Christian camps. You see people that their, their friends are being baptized... And in and, and, and the, and the, and the joy and the rejoicing, they, they want to be a part of that. And some young people are baptized uh, just because of the group mentality. They see their friends being baptized and they go ahead and do it. Did I see a hand back here? That's fine. That, that's exactly what you've come across in so many instances. There are people who, in a denominational group concerning denominational baptism, that, and this, this is where the questions are critical. The questions that you ask are critical, um, in which you ask, how were you baptized? Why were you baptized? Were you saved before you were baptized? And there's just a list of questions that you ask, and I can get anyone a copy of that if they would like that. Also, they're presented in the Searching for Truth DVD on their section on baptism. They think, first of all, when you first meet them, they think their baptism is scriptural. No matter what it is, the pastor, the priest baptized them, therefore it's scriptural. But then when you start showing them what the Bible says and you compare their answers that they give to the questions to what the Bible actually says, Sometimes they will waffle a little bit and say, oh, that's what I did. That's what I did. When in reality, that's not what they did according to their answers. And that's why those answers on a piece of paper are so critical because because people don't want to think they didn't do what God said. And therefore, when they see it there on the paper written down, "Here, here are your answers, and you confront it with, here's what the Bible actually says, it'll either you know, cause that light to go on in their head or um, they'll reject it. But there's a lot of times when people say that they were baptized to obey God, to please God, even for the forgiveness of sin. Some people will even say that. But then you ask them, were you saved before you were baptized? And they'll say yes. Well, if you were saved before you were baptized, then you were not baptized for the forgiveness of sins. As we will see, baptism is for a little bit later on. So there, that, that's why it's very critical to get those answers written down on a piece of paper so that the story can stay straight because the story will go all over the map with so many people because um, they, they think they've done God's will and it's hard for them to come to the reality that they haven't. So uh, a lot of times... That's the only way to study with someone as far as questions and answer multiple choice when it comes to corresponding to someone through the mail. I mean, that's the only way that you're going to be able to, to, to study with them. But that's a very good point. There are um, a, a lot of people who, who even claim that they, 
were baptized for the forgiveness of sins. I'll tell you this, that when I was back in um, Virginia a few weeks ago, working with uh, Johnny Robertson, um, I came across one of the people I appeared on the television show with. He has a background in the Christian church denomination. And when he heard the truth by hearing Johnny Robertson preach on TV, he obeyed and was baptized, even though he had been baptized in the Christian church, who claims to baptize for the forgiveness of sins. So I, I asked him about that. I said, do they really do that? He said, no. That's their claim. They all say, oh, we baptize for the forgiveness of sins. But they have a baptismal Sunday just like any kind of denomination does. And he says the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins was not even mentioned when he was baptized into that group. So lip service and reality are, are two different things. And that's what we're finding when you compare it to uh, what the Bible actually says. Yes? Yes, there are various groups, Pentecostal groups, that believe that a Holy Spirit baptism goes on today. Uh, and the miraculous activities, the speaking in tongues, the, uh, the healings and such. Um, uh, but those things, of course, we know from the Bible have passed away. They don't occur today. I know that for a fact because I've tried to put these people to the test and they can't come up with healing anybody. I've, I've, I've tried to talk to these people who claim to have these miracles and they just they don't have the ability they claim to have. So, uh, they, again, that's a misunderstanding too. So many people say, well, there's Holy Spirit baptism and water baptism today when Ephesians 4, I believe it's verse 4, says there's only one baptism. So it can't be both. And uh, Holy Spirit baptism had its purpose fulfilled in the first century. So when we look at this list and we see here baptism because friends are doing it, that's, that's something that I've run into even among the Lord's people. Later on, they'll grow up, they'll study their Bible, and they say, I want to be baptized. And it was because they were baptized because their friends were being baptized uh, the first time. That's broken baptism. Just being, bab being baptized by a gospel preacher in a building that says Church of Christ on the sign does not automatically make it scriptural if the person's motivation is not correct. And that's what we're kind of dealing with here with these last, last few points. The motivation is not correct. Baptism to please parents. Are there children that have been baptized in baptistries just like ours that do it to please their parents? Their parents want them to be baptized. They'll even pressure them into being baptized. And uh, they're baptized to please their parents. Well, that's broken baptism. You're, you're pleasing the wrong person. It's to be pleasing to God. And parents do a disservice to their children if they force them and coerce them into the baptistry. It's got to be their choice. Or it's not really their faith. Baptism to please a spouse. Has that not happened? Someone will marry outside the church. You'll have a Christian woman marry someone that's of a denomination or is not even religious at all. And that, that wife will uh, influence th that person. And just to get them off their back, they'll go and be baptized. That's broken baptism. That's not pleasing to God. And so I, I've talked to people uh, who are in situations like that, and I tell them, do not do this to please your wife or your husband. If you're doing it for that reason, I'm not going to baptize you. And so we can't be doing it for ple to, to please anyone else. We have to please God ultimately. And then I found this a lot Baptism at a young age, not knowing what you were doing. There have been so many people that have come up to me who are members of the church, quote unquote, for years. They were baptized at a very young age, and they said, I didn't know what I was doing. I want to I be baptized to obey the Lord. I've done it in secret, so to speak, with people who were active members of the church but they through their study they realized they 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 did not do it with a proper motivation 
And so they were baptized into Christ in, in, a, in a sense uh, to, um, to make, make, the, make things right. So here are some things. Does, does anyone, can anyone come up with anything else? Sure. 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 Yeah, I mean, that would be it. That would be the, the key to the problem, not knowing what you were doing. And, and uh, th- that would affect any age, you know, not knowing what you were doing. The mind has to be engaged in obeying God's commands for the reason God gave the command. We can't just obey God's commands blindly. We have to do it for the reason God gave the command. Okay. When we look at this, we're looking at broken baptism. We see that the Ephesians there, they had broken baptism. But then Paul told them the truth about New Testament baptism. So this brings us to the section on our handout, New Testament baptism. Faith, confession, and repentance come before baptism. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. This is the day the church began. They asked, what must we do? They realized that they had killed the Son of God. They realized that they were in sin. They realized they were guilty before God. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he's telling people who are recognizing their guilty condition, here's what you have to do. You have to repent and you have to be baptized. Uh, we see confession in Acts chapter 8. Look at Acts chapter 8. The Ethiopian eunuch here. Philip is preaching to him. Now they came down the road and they came to some water. The eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said to him, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the confession. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Verse 38 shows you the action of baptism. It's immersion. It's not sprinkling. It's not pouring. It's immersion in water. He went down into the water, and he immersed him. Then they came up out of the water, verse 39. So we see the action there. So faith, confession, and repentance all come before baptism. That excludes babies. That excludes atheists. That excludes anyone who doesn't believe. Babies can't believe. They have no sins to repent of. They're not capable of repenting. And they cannot confess. So, baptism is not for infants. So, we've already touched on it in in Acts 2 and verse 38, when we're talking about biblical baptism. For the forgiveness of sins. Let's look further. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. Why were they being baptized? The question is, why? In Acts 2 and verse 38. Why, Peter, are they to repent and be baptized? He gives the answer, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're not saved until your sins are forgiven. Being saved and having your sins forgiven are saying the same thing with different words. You cannot be saved in your sins. And you cannot be forgiven if you're in an unsaved condition. So being saved and, being, and having the forgiveness of sins is saying the same thing just with different words. So baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins. Their sins were not forgiven until they repented and they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That means by His authority. It's His New Testament. That's why we're talking about New Testament baptism. He is the covenant giver now. He died and shed His blood to to bring about salvation. It's His testament. Therefore, we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It's also to be saved. Look at Mark. 
Mark chapter 16. Verse 15 and 16. The Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. It is to be saved. Now notice that verse very carefully. Verse 16. Jesus is telling us in this verse who's going to be saved. Who will be saved, Lord? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He didn't say he who believes will be saved. He didn't say he who, be- he who is baptized will be saved. He says he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's the person who will be saved according to Jesus in Mark 16 and verse uh, 16. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Someone says, well, it doesn't say and is not baptized. That's not necessary to do. Because a believer is condemned already. They're condemned in their unbelief. And a belie- uh, an unbeliever is not going to be baptized. They're not going to obey God's will. So here is a person who is obedient to God's will. Who will be saved, Lord? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And notice Jesus did not say, He who believes and is saved will be baptized. He didn't say that. So we see here that New Testament baptism is to be saved. It's to save us. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> Peter's talking about the flood in verse 20. Eight souls were saved through water. The like figure, verse 21... <laughs> The life figure wherein to baptism does also now save us. Or, another translation says, there is an antitype which now saves us, baptism. 1 Peter 3.21 Baptism saves us. It now saves us, baptism, depending on your translation. It's not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not the water, it's the blood of Christ but the blood of Christ forgives in the waters of baptism. So for someone to say, you, you don't have to be saved, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, this is what the Holy Spirit's saying here in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism saves. I mean, that's, that's plain and clear. So it's to save us, Mark 16 and verse 16, and baptism does also now save us, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Baptism is done to wash away our sins. Look at Acts chapter 22. <coughs> Acts chapter 22, and verse 16. This is Saul of Tarsus, or, or Paul rather, talking about his conversion in the time that his sins were washed away by the blood of Christ. And Ananias told him, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So here you see here that in baptism, sins are washed away. Now Peter already said it's not by the water. We know it's the blood that does that, Revelation 1 and verse 5. But it's in baptism that the blood of Christ washes away sins. Just the other morning, you know, I keep my grandpa two nights a week and I flip through the television and I look at some of that early morning stuff. Jimmy Swagger was on TV with his television program out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And he was talking about the time that Saul of Tarsus was saved on the road to Damascus. He was not saved on the road to Damascus. And he just said that in passing and went on. And people, if they don't study for themselves, they'll accept that. Saul of Tarsus did not say he was saved on the road to Damascus. He was saved when he arose, was baptized, and had his sins washed away, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22 and verse 16. People have got to study for themselves and stop listening to these TV preachers and these denominational pastors that are leading them astray. 
Baptism is done to be born again to a new life. Look at John chapter 3. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He's talking about being born again. That means conversion. That means being saved. He says, Most assuredly I say to you that unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You cannot go to heaven. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the Spirit. That's, that's the words of Christ that goes along with Mark 16 and verse 16. Those passages are parallel. They're just saying the same thing in different words. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, remember, baptism is done to be born again and to give us a new life. For time's sake, I'm going to abbreviate this here in Romans 6. Look at verse 3, Romans 6 and verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. That's the action. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. That's when the newness of life comes, after baptism. We've been united together in the likeness of his death. We certainly will be in the likeness of his resurrection. So baptism is done to be born again to a new life. Baptism also, staying there in Romans 6, baptism is done to put us into Christ. Salvation is in Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. And baptism puts us into Christ. Romans 6, verse 3, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? So it's into Christ. Now look at Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Twenty six and twenty seven. Paul writing to the churches of Galatia. Notice the tenses of the words that he uses in verse twenty six and twenty seven. What you are and what you were. Verse twenty six. You are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. He's talking to Christians. What were they done? What were in verse twenty seven? As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's what you did in your past to give you this present condition. You are the children of God because you were baptized into Christ and you put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 to 27. You're baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. Then baptism is done to add us to the church. Because the church is the saved. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Again, back to when the church began. Praising God, having favor with all the people. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You tie that in with verse 41 earlier in the chapter. Those who gladly received the word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Added to the church. Because the church is the saved. So we see here that all of these things are done in baptism. And they're all saying the same thing in different ways. They're all saying the same thing in different ways, and that is, you must be baptized if you want to go to heaven. You must be baptized to be saved. Now, we don't have much time now. Back to Acts chapter 19. Here you see the honesty of the, these individuals. Here you see their honesty. Look at verse 5. When they heard this, heard about New Testament baptism, and that's what we're talking about, New Testament baptism, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. <coughs> Verse 7 says there were about 12 men in all. 
You know, they, there, there doesn't seem to be any hesitancy here for them to accept the truth. They didn't argue about the thief on the cross. They didn't talk about what if this, what if that, what if, what if you can't get to what... They didn't talk about any of that. When they found out that their baptism was not right, when they found out their baptism was broken, they were going to fix it. That's exactly what they did. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next week, time's up for us. Next week, uh, we're going to have our singing and scripture reading because the week following that is when we're going to have our family Bible school. So next Wednesday night, we're just going to not have class. We're just going to have a singing Wednesday night. Thank you very much for your kind attention.